a great pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Lee Zhang. I um, came from Stanford AIR. The AIR is a creation of AI, robotics and education. And, and that's the thing I'm going to talk about tonight, you guys. So first, I want to talk about this. Computer. This is a word that everybody knows. And everybody is so familiar with it. And now I have a question. Do you know when was this word that first used in the human history? Or when was this invented? Any guess? 1930. 1930. Okay, that's a typical answer. Uh, any other? Any other guess? Like 17th century. 17th century. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Getting close. <laughs> so, okay. Well, here's the answer. 1613. So 400 years ago. Well, then you might think, wow, that's 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 400 years ago. Then at that time. It cannot mean a, a computer like this, right? So what does that mean? At that time, it, it, it means it's a person performing mathematic calculation. In other words, it, it's a human computer, OK? So then I have a picture to show a group of human computers work together, and, and that's in NASA. And then people are wondering, okay, what, when do we shift the meaning of computer from from person to machines, right? And that happens in 1960s. So basically, for the past 400 years that we use computer uh, as a word, there's 350 years we use it to refer to a person. And then for 50 to 60 years, we use it to refer to a machine. Um, the reason I mention about this is that I was often, often asked about this question, will robots with AI replace a lot of people's jobs? Well, obviously the answer is yes. And actually that kind of thing happened all the time in the human history. Then why this time it become particularly scary? That's probably because in the past we were using artificial power to replace the power of muscle. The muscle from human or animals. But this time we're using the <coughs> artificial brain to replace the human brain power. That is scary. So then, let's look at this. How many of you know about this? What, what, what exactly is this? Uh, good. Well, actually, this crowd is good. I, I saw about like 40%. Usually, if I talk about this in Asia, it's like 99% people know about this. and then. In the class I'm, I'm giving at Stanford, and I tried this uh, this January, and the percentage was 10%. 90% of the graduate student in the engineering school and in the School of Education didn't know about this. So this is, is off for go, right? So let me play a video. Go is the world's oldest computer. It's been one of the simplest and also most abstract. Beating a professional player at Go is a long-standing challenge of artificial intelligence. Everything we've ever tried in AI just falls over when you try the game of Go. The number of possible configurations of the board is more than the number of atoms in the universe. AlphaGo found a way to learn how to play Go. So far, AlphaGo has beaten every challenge we've given it, but we won't know its true strength until we play somebody who is in the top of the world, like Lisa Dodd. A match like no other is about to get underway in South Korea. Lisa Dodd is to go what Roger Federer is to tennis. Just the very thought of a machine playing a human is inherently intriguing. The place is a madhouse. Welcome to the Deep Mind Challenge for Worlds. Watching Can Lisa Dodd find AlphaGo's weakness? Whoa. Is there, in fact, a weakness? The game kind of turned on its axis. Originally, that is not a confident face. It's developing into a very, very dangerous fight. Who hold the phone? Read this left to room. In the end, it is about the pride. I think you know, something went wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's made the It's got to be clear. These ideas that are driving AlphaGo are going to drive our future. This is it, folks. Okay, so when we talk about these AI play games, 
The first thing usually we think about is in 1997 when the IBM Deep Blue uh, defeated the human champion of chess. At that time, people were thinking, well, the chess is 8 by 8. Then go try Go, because that's 19 by 19. And it's a lot harder. And then usually people compare the game of Go with the universe to, to tell how complex that game is. And, and if you remember in that trailer, there's one sentence saying that the number of ways that you can play Go is, is actually larger than the number of atoms in the universe. So this sentence is, is actually correct but not accurate. Let me show you. So the number of atoms in the universe is 10 to the power of 80, right? And then the number of ways that you can play Go is 10 to the power of 768. So what does that mean if, if you study mathematics? This means that if you turn every atom in the universe into a universe, and then turn every atom in that universe into another universe, still, still the number of ways that you can pl play Go game is bigger. So that's how complex this is. And also, here's the relationship, right? Way bigger. <laughs> um, in, in East Asia, people treat this game as the crown of intelligence, right? And people will not be surprised that you can recognize a cat or a dog, because everybody can do it. But for this game, only the really, really, really smart people can do it well. And however, we get defeated by AI on this game. That was a disaster for so many people's believing, you know? It's like, oh my god, then we're <coughs> losing. And so, so that actually, well, let me skip a little bit. Um, a lot of people are thinking that AI is going to be the terminator and has the possibility to, to terminate this world because what, what if it can develop its own thoughts and self-consciousness and that kind of thing, right? To, well, I don't, you know, this thing can, can talk forever, but I would like to give you a, my opinion is that no, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen in that way. And we are, our AI research is still pretty rudimentary. Even though we can, we can do Go game, but that kind of game is actually pretty, I won't say easy, but it's not that hard for a computer to do. Okay, so I will need to get to the two sub concept, the strong AI and weak AI. So weak AI refers to AIs that can only do specific jobs like one or two specific jobs. And the strong AI is the AI, which could be scary, uh, which means that it means uh, AI can do everything a, a human can do. And now the status of our AI research is like this. Our strong AI is pretty weak. We could not make any strong AI that is as smart, smart as like a three-year-old three or even two-year-old. But our weak AI is getting stronger and stronger. So basically all the AI stories that you heard nowadays, it's all weak AIs, okay? So robots with weak AI will replace many jobs in the next 10, 20 years. So we don't need to worry about that the human species could get terminated by AI, however, we do need to worry about the future, about the jobs, and what our kids can do. So according to the uh, study from Oxford University, 47% of the current jobs in the US will be in danger in the next 10, 20 years. And then that number is 77 for China. And also there's uh, some papers from the Department of Labor of US says that among all the students that nowadays are in the K-12 education system, they will eventually work in a job that is not exist yet. Like seven, that, that percentage is 76 or it's 65%. So 65% of the current student will work on a job that is not existed yet. So in that sense, if, if we keep doing this, we will be in, in trouble, right? Because 
the, the current generation that is in the school system could be the first generation that will be replaced right after school. It's, it, there's a very big possibility. And then I would like you to <coughs> look at some interesting things. Can you guess what is this in that box? This is 1956. Computer. Computer, computer right? Yeah. Some, somebody said computer. Mm -hmm. It's a hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> and guess how big it is? It's five meg. <laughs> it's five megabyte. And it, it's a hard drive. And now what we have? We have this. We even have two terabyte, right? In the SD card. And then, okay, this is a, a, a camera 100 years ago. And now everybody have this in the cell phone. And actually even smaller, we are able to make cameras like this small, and this one is one millimeter by one millimeter by one millimeter, okay? So that's how small it can get. Now, you can t the top line is now, and this is in the history, right? So a car now, this is from Mercedes, this is a real car. It's not a computer graphics, okay? So then, 100 years ago, we, we drive this kind of car. <laughs> And then now we have full screen cell phones now, even better than the iPhone X, okay, so. And 100 years ago we have this. Now let's look. A classroom now is like this, right? It's like what, you know, we're seeing. 100 years ago, it's still like this, <laughs> right? It's very similar. There's not that much change. So basically, There's discussion uh, now. Yeah. There wasn't discussion. <laughs> oh, that's right. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, the current, let's say the K-12 education system or the whole education system, like you spend six years in elementary school and six years in the middle and high school, and then you go to college, right? That kind of system was uh, defined in 1892 by the Committee of Ten in the United States. And I look into some of these documents, they actually suggested we start to teach physics and chemistry uh, in middle school at that time. So it's still like that now. So that, that's, that's an issue. And then let's look at this. I have some numbers here, 1900 and 100. What does that mean? It means before 1900, our human our knowledge doubles every 100 years. And when we get to 1950s, our knowledge doubles every 25 years. And nowadays, it doubles every one year. It's scary because, let's ask this question, how many times will our knowledge grow in 20 years? That's an easy mathematic problem. It's two to the power of 20, that equals to a million times. In 20 years, our knowledge will grow a million times. And you might find that very hard to swallow or hard to believe. Like it. But let me give you an example. So back 20 years ago, 1998, we were using this type of computer, Windows 98. And if you notice, we have uh, something like this. It's called the floppy disk. <laughs> and it's like that. And it, it holds 1.44 megabyte data. And think about that thumb drive that you have now. It's easy that you, you can hold like two terabytes. So that is more than a million times of difference in 20 years. Okay, so our feeling, that's our feeling. <laughs> it's mind blowing. And also, it, it never happened in a human history that we need to deal with this, this much data and information. Our brain was not developed to, to handle that. We can't handle that. However, there's something coming which, which is AI. This actually, AI gives us an opportunity to handle this situation. So don't be afraid of this. And now I'm going to tell you, on the conceptual level, there's a lot of differences, but I'm trying to make something that is easy to, for everybody to understand, right? So now I'm going to compare the artificial intelligence with human intelligence. First, let me draw a circle. Let's say 
that, that is the area of intelligence, right? Then, as we mentioned, um, the AI, all the AIs we talk about now is weak AI means that it only does one or two jobs. So it's kind of finding a point and drill a hole under it, right? So then when you do more, it's like this. You do something really good like AlphaGo, and then you drill really deep. But no, ma no matter what you do, it's kind of like all these holes. And then human covers the whole thing and, and, and do everything on that surface, but human does not do very deep in a lot of these areas. So you can see these two types of intelligence are very different. They actually compensate with each other. So that's how we need to treat this thing. We need to make them work together, right? So I want to mention that the key to the future education is something we call AI thinking. <coughs> what is that? It basically means um, everybody need to understand how AI works on the conceptual level so that you don't make wrong decisions. Once you understand how AI works, because there's actually a lot of misunderstanding about AI, and um, once you understand that, you will gain the ability to differentiate yourself from the AI, and then you will gain the ability to work with the AI. So, I talk about computer at the beginning of the talk. Now I want to come back to this story to continue on this. How many of you saw this movie? Wow, that's good. A lot of you know this. So, these three persons are the human computers in NASA, right? And then, in the 1960s, NASA got this IBM 7090. And then Dorsey, which is this lady, she's the manager of that group of human computers, and she realized that there's no way a human can compete with computers on calculation. It's a situation very similar to what we are facing right now. And then you want to be differentiated from the computer. So she did her research, she found out, well, then the computers need programmers. So she decided to study Fortran. And then she not only teach herself Fortran, but she taught the whole group Fortran. So on the day when her manager wanted to lay the whole department off, and she says, well, now we're not computers, we're programmers, right? So they kept the job, right? So she did a very smart move to differentiate themselves from the computer. And then they gained the, the capability to work with the computer. Now we're facing the AI revolution. We need to do the same thing, which is this, right? So, and also I want to mention that AI is not a typical, let's say, innovation that only impacts the small area. It is a platform level innovation that can be applied to almost every, every places, just <coughs> like electricity, so that everyone needs to understand that. And just to give another example, because I'm on the last page, so I don't need to worry about time. Uh, people always talk about AI does not have creativity. Uh, or some people say it does have some kind of creativity. Um, we actually developed an AI uh, could draw the Chinese painting. And then they get to the level that actually it's, it's hard for a, a not professional painter to distinguish which one is drawn by human or a AI, so that actually when, when we show this to anyone, people might be very easy for them to say, wow, AI does have creativity. God, then what can we do, right? Now we're all replaced. But the thing is that, yes, AI has a creativity that is very different from human. When AI draws something, it just goes, one nanosecond or you know, one microsecond, it's there. It's, it's not drawing something by a brush by another brush and it's like, here's a tree, I want to draw a river and, and like that. It's not like that. So if you ask AI, what did you draw? And AI is like, I don't know. You, you figure it out, right? So, <laughs> two minutes. So, <laughs> um, but in the future, the AI might very well lower the barrier for people to draw very good paintings. For example, I never got any painting you know, training. Maybe, but in the future, I could turn into a pretty good painter that I just talk with the AI, say, well, 
make some trees on the left and make mountains on the right and draw rivers. And then I said, well, this feeling is not right and tweak it a little bit. So basically, that makes me jump over that uh, hurdle of my motor skill so that actually a lot more people can draw after using AI. So anyway, that, that's, that's, that's it. Thank you very much.